Hi, this is Justin Coletti, Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And today, we're going to be talking all about frequency analyzers. I actually got this question coming in a bunch this week, both in my email inbox and recently I did a live Q&A for members of the Mastering Demystified course, and three people all at once asked this same question, how do you use frequency analyzers? And I've got some thoughts on this because there are ways to use frequency analyzers really well that are going to enhance what you're going to do. And there are ways to use them really counterproductively. And I find that a lot of people, when they first start using frequency analyzers, use them kind of counterproductively. And there are ways to use these tools to make what you're doing sound worse. And we'll talk about how to avoid that. Let's get right into it. Before we do, I need to give the briefest of shout outs to this week's sponsors. Who are our sponsors? Well, the biggest one always is you. How do you sponsor this podcast? Well, you can sponsor with your likes, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, or give us a rating and review on one of the podcast platforms. But even better than that is sponsoring yourself. You can sponsor yourself by taking one of our great full-length courses like Mixing Breakthroughs, which will teach you how to mix faster, better, more creatively, and with more confidence than ever before. You're going to find your quality improve while your time to finish mixes goes down. Check that out over at mixingbreakthroughs.com. Comes with a full money back guarantee. Thousands of students have gone through this course. And every week my inbox is filled with people who've taken this and had true breakthroughs for themselves with tremendous before and after results. And if you want to check out our full-length course on mastering, you can check it out over at MasteringDemystify.com, where you can learn everything that I know about mastering, which is what I do day in and day out as my audio work these days. Last couple of quick sponsor shout-outs, big shout-out and thanks to Antelope Audio sponsoring the podcast this month. If you are looking for an interface that has DSP power, whether a really small, portable, bus-powered one, or if you're looking for something that is rack-mountable for a bigger studio, they've got you covered with a whole great line of Antelope effects. They also make a great line of modeling microphones that sound really persuasively like some of the best and most iconic microphones of all time. You can hear me demo one of them, the most affordable modeling microphone out there standalone, the Axino, which you can check out right here on this channel. I'll link to that as well. Also, big shout out and thanks to Sound Toy sponsoring this podcast from the beginning, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. All right, without further ado, let's get right into it. Frequency analyzers and how to use them. Here's the way to not use frequency analyzers. Don't look at them. Look for weird humps and bumps in your mixes, and then try to smooth them out. This is wrong and almost 100% backwards, and the right way to use them is almost the opposite of this, and we'll get into that in a second. But there is some kernel of truth that leads people in this direction of wanting to use a frequency analyzer in that way. Because the reality is, if you took a million of the best recorded songs, best mixes, best productions in history, and averaged them all together, the final result on a frequency analyzer, the average of all these songs, would look something a little bit like pink noise on the frequency analyzer. Pretty smooth, no crazy bumps or humps in any one given direction. And you could take that average and then try to adjust your master or your mix so it fits into that average. And you're finding the sweet spot and you're taking almost a scientific approach to getting the right overall frequency curve for your record. And that's wrong, in my opinion. Because going into that average are all of these beautiful, unique recordings that deviate from the average in so many ways, so many different cool ways. And in fact, if you take some of your favorite recordings ever, you might find some characteristic about them and say, ooh, on this particular record, there's something about the vocals, there's this presence in them that's really beautiful and different from other records. And if you were to look at it in a frequency analyzer, you might find that, say, 8K is actually kind of overabundant in that particular mix. There's a bit of an unruly bump or hump in 8K on that particular track. And maybe there's another song where you say, oh, the cymbals or the, the vocals on this one, there's this different kind of air about it, this kind of sheen that's going on that's really nice. And you look at that one, there's actually a little bit of a dip at 8K and a little bit of a pronounced hump around 12K. And it's deviating from average, but it sounds awesome. And that's part of what's giving the thing its personality and its character. The same kind of thing can happen in the low end. On one particular mix, you might say, oh, there's this knock here in the kick drum. There's this tightness going on. And I really love what's happening. And it feels so amped up to me. But then you look at a frequency analyzer and you say, whoa, the sub is kind of 
drop off on this record. There's not nearly as much subcontent in this record as some others, but it sounds awesome and it's perfect for the personality of that record and for the goals of that production. And yet there's going to be another record where the exact opposite thing happens and there's this softening going on at 100 and there's some extra subs and that's what's giving that record its personality that you love. And you could go in and try to steamroll out any and all of that stuff by first looking at a frequency analyzer, seeing that something looks different than the average, and then trying to basically iron it out and ultimately destroy the interesting personality and character that makes that production unique and have its own sonic statement. Because the problem here is that there are good humps and bad humps. There are good dips and bad dips. And the frequency analyzer doesn't know which is which. The only thing that knows which is which is you by applying your own tastes to the production, by applying your years and years of listening to great sounding records and figuring out how should this record sound. So the best way to use a frequency analyzer is to flip that completely on its head. I'm not going to be one of these people who tells you, don't use a frequency analyzer, only use your ears, your ears are all that matter. Like, yeah, your ears are are all that matters. Ultimately, what's important is not how it looks, but how it sounds. But frequency analyzers can be useful in revealing things to you and helping your ears get better. And that's what these techniques that I'm going to talk about are all going to help you do. So the very first one is the inversion of that bad approach. It is to first stop, turn off the frequency analyzer if you have one going, and listen. And ask yourself, what, if anything, needs to change? you make the determination as to whether there's a problem at all. And then you consult the frequency analyzer to help you figure out exactly where that problem is. So I'll give you an example. Say in a particular track you're working on, there's too much sibilance in the vocal. Where is that too much sibilance? Is it at 6K? Is it at 9K? Is it at 7K? I don't know. Guess who does know? The frequency analyzer knows. Open up the frequency analyzer, look at it, and you hear that when you're hearing that sibilance happening, there's this big leap up happening at 7.5K. So then you can go and target your EQ cut to 7.5K. And this is helping you make EQ boosts and cuts that are more effective, more efficient, that are having less spillover effects into other elements, and are just better targeted to the problem you're trying to solve. A similar thing could happen in the low end. On this particular track, you're hearing something go on with the kick drum, where there's, it just feels like there's a little bit too much sub energy that's taking away from the bass and doesn't sound like other records in this idiom. Where is that too much sub energy in the kick drum? Well, you listen to it and you look at the frequency analyzer and you see every time that kick's hitting, there's this huge hump up at 55 hertz, let's say it is. And you go in there and you try to add some control and maybe do an EQ cut at 55 hertz. And now you're targeting your EQ cut to the place that's going to get you the most precision, the most efficiency, the less least spillover effects into other areas you don't want to have an effect on. And you're just using your EQ so much more efficiently because you consulted the frequency analyzer. So using this tool to zero in on areas where you've already made a determination that something needs to change, that's the way to use it. And this sounds like such a minor thing, but it's such a monumental shift in the way you actually use them if you've been using them the wrong way before, if anything is wrong in music production. Hopefully this sounds obvious in hindsight now that I've said it, but I think that's the best way to use them. But that's not the only way to use them. Frequency analyzers can also tell you about things you shouldn't be messing with. So here's another example. Let's take the low end again. You're mixing something or mastering something, and there's this problem with the bass. There's this one note that the bass hits that seems to jump out relative to other notes that the bass is playing. It just blossoms a bit too much. Well, where is that note? Is it at 60 hertz? Is it 70 hertz? Is it 80 hertz? Let's try to ask Mr. Frequency Analyzer so we can zero in and make the adjustment in the right place. And you're listening and looking at the frequency analyzer, and when this bass note hits, there doesn't appear to be anything out of the ordinary that the frequency analyzer is showing you. It's still telling you something, though. It's telling you that maybe the problem isn't in that bass. The problem is in your room. So rather than going in 
chasing your own tail, obsessively trying to narrow in in the right spot to apply a multiband compressor or dynamic EQ or make a conventional EQ cut in the right area, what you should be doing is saying, oh, wait a second, I'm getting feedback. I'm getting feedback that my room has a big hump at, maybe it's at 85 hertz, and that's the problem. My room, not the bass, so I'm not going to go in there and try to fix a problem that doesn't actually exist in the music. It only exists in my listening environment. There's other related ways to use frequency analyzers as well to help you learn more about your room and listening environment, which is super important. Ideally, you're in a perfectly tuned, perfectly treated room with great monitors, and that's how you're making all your listening decisions. But so many people, particularly who are mixing, are on systems that are pretty compromised below 50 hertz and maybe below 60 hertz, and in a lot of cases, below... 80 hertz, and in a lot of situations, even up as high as 100 hertz, they can't really trust what's going on in the low end. One potential thing to do here is listen to a lot of records in your space to get a sense memory for what low end should sound like in your room, skewed as it may be. But this can also be complemented by a frequency analyzer that will tell you things about your low end that you're just not going to hear because maybe your speakers don't even reproduce 50 hertz. Maybe they don't really reproduce 60 hertz at all, and you can't develop a sense memory in those areas. This is particularly true for people who are mixing on headphones. Some of the really popular high-end Sennheiser headphones for mixing are excellent, really flat, neutral, mid-range, and high frequencies, but there's not a lot happening below 100 hertz to make educated decisions about the low end. And if you're on a system like that, this can be extremely helpful to develop a sense memory not only for what low end should sound like in your room, but what well-balanced low-end generally looks like on a frequency analyzer across your favorite records in this particular genre. Because you'll start to get a sense for, I can't really hear what's going on at 60 hertz, but that sure looks like a lot compared to a lot of my favorite records. Or that looks like very little sub-information compared to so many records in here. And you can start making some decisions about exactly how much sub-energy should be in there when you can't hear the subs basically at all. So this is another thing to do, but you're never going to learn how to read it that way unless you're going in and taking some of your favorite commercial releases and listening to what they should sound like in your space as well as to what they look like on the frequency analyzer. That's not to say that this is the cure and you should just stop there and rely on it. You should be looking at ways to improve the response of your monitoring system so you can hear and trust low frequencies better than you are today. But it sure can help. And it can help you from going wildly astray. So those are three overall ways to use a frequency analyzer. One, you first make the determination of what should change, if anything, and then you just use it to help you zero in on exactly the right spot to make your EQ cuts or boosts more efficient, more effective, more targeted to exactly the problem you're trying to solve. Two, you can use them to discover when there's a problem not in the mix or in the master, but in your room environment. And three, they can help you kind of learn to work around some of the idiosyncrasies and limitations of your working environment. If you're using frequency analyzers in this way, instead of relying on them to make decisions for you, you're going to have a much better time and you're going to get much better results. Let me know. Do you use frequency analyzers in your own work? Tell me in the comments below. I want to hear about it. What's been an effective way to use them for you and what's been an ineffective way to use frequency analyzers for you? If you prefer to email me, you can shoot me your questions, comments over at podcast at sonicscoop.com. Big thanks again to you for joining us for this week's episode. If you want to sponsor this podcast by sponsoring yourself, check out our full-length courses, Mixing Breakthroughs over at mixingbreakthroughs.com where you will learn to mix faster, more creatively, with more confidence confidence than ever before. Also, if you want to learn everything I know about mastering, you can check out our full-length course, Mastering Demystified, where I'll tell you everything you need to know about getting started mastering, whether for yourself or for others. Last but not least, quick thanks to this week's brand sponsors. We got Antelope Audio making great DSP-powered interfaces. There's some great deals on bundles with their software effects and modeling microphones going on right now as I'm recording this episode, so check them out at antelopeaudio.com. Also, shout out and thanks to Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. Thanks again for hanging out with me. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time.